welcome to episode 138 of Real Life Ghost Stories. To kick things off this week, I need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Milena Mag, Stein Sketne, Bella Bantavoglio, Shelly Ann Bonzer, Gillian Morton, Lindsay Bradish Banks, Robin Medeiros, Laura Barker, Netta Kay, Gemma Sheldon Brown, Audrey Celeste, Lee Stewart, Valeria Lawrence, Elizabeth Caracher, Nancy, Steph Baxter, Janice Thulin, Hannah Toon, Breed Nasilsha, and Christine Todd. Thank you so much for signing up to our Patreon. It is so appreciated. I'm so thankful for you. And Patreon will be back hopefully in September. Before we start today's episode, I need to be very clear about my sources for this because sometimes an episode is so wildly obscure that it's really hard to find reliable sources. So, I first heard about this story on This Paranormal Life and it's episode 29 and episode 30. So they did a two-parter on this story. And if you want a comedy take on the story, then Kit and Rory are the people for you. The links to everything is going to be in the description as always. So if you want to go and listen to that afterwards, I would highly recommend it. I also need to do a massive shout out to Ben from the Dark Histories podcast. I hadn't listened to the Dark Histories before and I came across his episode on this particular case. It's season three, episode 12, and I used it as a fact checker for my version of the episode. And it is really, really good. A really good deep dive into this case. This case is bonkers. There's no other way to put it. It is wild. It has lived in my brain since I heard the This Paranormal Life episodes of it. And I just love it. You know I love a story that is really out there, really wild, and you think there's no way this can be real. But what happens if it is real? So I've split this into two parts. Um, I can't decide where I'm going to put the ad before the two stories or in between the two stories I don't know I will see I'll see what works best so let's get into it it was January the 28th 2003 and the morning was cold and crisp the people in the streets turned up the collars of their coats and tightened their scarves against the cold as they rushed to work but inside number 11 Wall Street the temperature was rising. The building seemed to buzz louder and louder like a beehive as men and women in suits scrambled around wide-eyed and barking instructions down telephones. A strange anticipatory hush suddenly descended over the building. The electronic boards continued to flash and glint as the faces in the room turned upwards towards a large balcony. Suited people with shiny, smiling faces stood on the balcony, whooping and clapping. Their eyes were vacant, but the eyes of the upturned faces, staring in anticipation, were anything but vacant. They were desperate and hungry. A smiling man in a suit stood with his hand hovering at waist height, and at the stroke of 9.30am he plunged his hand onto the button and a bell rang out around the building, and all hell broke loose. The stock market was open. This scene has been played and replayed day in, day out, for hundreds of years, growing in size and ferocity every year. Fortunes have been made and lost in an instant, and lives have been made and destroyed. It is an environment that is fraught with tension, despair, anxiety and joy, and today was no different. Well, it seemed no different to the untrained eye. But something nestled in the fervour wasn't quite right. Sitting quietly in the vast cavernous hall was a man. He was clean-shaven, and his dark hair was slicked back and wet with gel. His suit was grey and oddly ill-fitting, The people at the stock market generally looked sharp all of the time, with tailor-made suits and bespoke accessories. 
The ill-fitting suit wasn't what made him stand out, though. No one would have noticed the suit, really, as no one really had the time to stop and look at him. What was odd about him was his stillness. In this world of constant movement, shouting, panic and elation, he just sat, diligently watching the boards. For the past two weeks, Andrew Carlson had arrived to the New York stock market at 9am, generally later than his counterparts, but in enough time to take his seat and sip a coffee. He would sit quietly and mildly all day watching the boards, and he was in stark contrast to everything around him. But he had not gone unnoticed. On this day, the 28th of January, two more men entered number 11 Wall Street. They had been watching Andrew Carlson for about a week and decided that now was the time to pounce. They weaved their way through the bustling crowd. The noise was deafening and when they reached Andrew, the agent had to shout to make himself heard. Andrew Carlson, my name is Agent Smith, FBI, and you are under arrest for insider trading. To their surprise, Andrew looked up and let out a little laugh. I wondered when you guys would show up. There was no bitterness or sarcasm in his voice. He stood up, adjusted the legs of his trousers, and turned his back to the agents, holding his hands together behind his waist to allow himself to be handcuffed. Andrew Carlson was polite and affable. The agents were somewhat bemused by him. He showed no signs of stress or of the arrogant bravado that they often associated with the Wall Street types. This man was no Jordan Belfort. He seemed to be a normal, respectful man. So how then had he walked into the stock exchange two weeks previously and turned $800 into $350 million? Every move he made and every stock he touched turned to gold. Businesses that were not even on anyone's radar boomed and for Andrew the money rolled in. There are of course elements of stock trading that are down to sheer luck. It's an unpredictable game and some people end up on winning streaks. But not winning streaks like this. Not winning streaks that turn $800 into $350 million in two weeks. Carlson had made 126 high-risk trades and had come out on top every single time. And now he was left with two choices. Either give up the names of his insiders or sit in a cell on Rikers Island. But what emerged from Carlson's four-hour confession was not the names of moles in the system, but something much more bizarre. Carlson claimed that the reason he had been so successful was because he just knew exactly what stocks would make gains. He had travelled back in time from 200 years in the future, or so he claimed. He knew that 2003 was a dire year in the stock market and he also knew that a few well-placed trades could make him a fortune. I got carried away, he said wryly in his videotaped confession. It was just too tempting to resist. I had planned to make it look natural, you know, to lose a little here and there so it didn't look too perfect. But I just got caught up in the moment. Carlson reportedly offered information in return for leniency and just wanted to get back to his own time. The FBI were obviously unmoved by the story. But they could find no evidence that Carlson existed before 2002. His bail was posted by an unknown source and Andrew Carlson was never seen or heard from again. I wanted to start with this story because it's one that I have alluded to on the podcast previously. I remember reading the story about the man who made it big on the stock market and came from the future. But the story isn't true. And trust me, I was just as disappointed as you are. The story was first posted on Weekly World News, which was a satirical news website. 
It was then, however, picked up by Yahoo News, where it was posted as fact and was subsequently reported as a true story literally all over the world. Even The Guardian and The Times posted about it. And this story fascinated people, me included. And it is a testament to our eternal fascination with time travel in all of its forms. We are desperate to know what we were and what we will become, and any hint of the ability to traverse time is jumped on by both casual observers and paranormal enthusiasts. The time-travelling hipster photograph is a prime example of our fascination with time travel. It's likely that you've seen this picture at some point, but just to remind you, the picture is a confirmed 100% genuine image from 1941. It is a photo of the crowd at the reopening of a bridge in British Columbia, and in the picture is a man that seems to be wearing a pair of modern sunglasses, a t-shirt with some sort of motif on the front, and a button-down cardigan. And he does look weirdly out of place, and weirdly modern. Fashion historians have suggested that the outfit is unusual for the circumstances, but not actually beyond the realms of possibility for that time. But it continues to be used as an indication that time travellers covertly exist among us. For today's story, I will hopefully be telling you a tale of time travel that you haven't heard before. And it's a story of time travel that doesn't quite fit the conventions. And it starts in 1984 and centres around a BBC Model B personal computer. Ken Webster and his girlfriend Debbie were living with their housemate Nicola in the small village of Doddleston in Cheshire, England. They were returning from a night out and were having their final cup of tea before retiring to bed. Debbie rummaged around the sink looking for a teaspoon and saw something flash out of the corner of her eye. She looked up, clocked what it was, and promptly took no notice. Ken had brought home a computer from his job as an economics teacher so that Debbie could use the word processor to write a screenplay. The computer was a precious commodity at the time, and in the beginning they had almost been afraid to use it for fear of somehow damaging it. The flash of light came from the neon green cursor that blinked on the screen. Debbie continued getting the tea ready, and as she did so, she cast her mind back to earlier in the evening, when she was sure she had finished typing and powered off the computer. She must not have had, so she went to the computer to reread what she had written. Ken, she called. I think you need to see this. Before the blinking cursor was a new file titled KDN, and it contained a text that read Ken, Debbie, Nick, true are the nightmares of a person that fears, safe are the bodies of the silent world. Turn pretty flower towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow, but the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. They gathered around the tiny black screen and read and reread the neon green words. They made no sense. No one in the house had written them and they made the assumption that it was some long dormant file that they had not previously noticed on the computer. But the poem gave Ken a strange prickling feeling. Something wasn't right. Something hadn't been right in the house for some time, and this wasn't the first weird thing that had happened. When they had moved into the cottage, Ken had set about redecorating. The cottage was old, it needed refurbishment, and the paint was peeling in places. He was in the process of painting the kitchen when he noticed something strange on the wall. There seemed to be shapes, shadows almost, that went up the wall and into the ceiling. He gulped as he realised that they were footprints. Spindly, six-toed footprints that seemed to climb up the wall and disappear into the ceiling. He laughed at the absurdity of it. 
Of course they weren't footprints, that's ridiculous. This was clearly a case of pareidolia and his brain was just trying to form the shapes on the wall into something familiar. He thought it must be some old grime, so he washed down the walls and painted over them. And the next morning, they were there again. All three members of the household regularly found bottles, cans and containers stacked up precariously in the kitchen. Sometimes the stacks were up to four feet high. Footsteps could be heard on the ceiling and throughout the house at night time. And again they thought it was simply the sounds of animals or just the old wooden beams of the cottage settling at night. Each member of the household secretly thought the other one was responsible for playing some sort of weird prank. And eventually they forgot about the strange poem. Two months later, the three had been for a drive and returned to see a new file saved on the computer. The file was saved as re and within they found another message. What strange words thou speak, although I must confess that I hath also been ill-schooled. Sometimes, methinks, alterations are somewhat barful, for they break many asleeps in mine bed. I hath seen many alterations, lastly charge house and thy home, tis a fitting place, with lights which devil maketh. L.W. The frightened housemates, after secretly suspecting that someone in the house was responsible for the prank, suddenly entertained the idea that it was someone from outside the house. Were the footsteps and the messages linked? Was somebody breaking in to leave the messages? And if so, why were they writing in what seemed to be an old dialect? Ken printed the message and took it to his colleague, Peter Trinder, who was a teacher of medieval literature. Peter confirmed that the message was completely accurate to a dialect of older English and told Ken, If someone has written this, they're an expert in this dialect from this time. It's perfect. This did nothing to alleviate Ken's fears. He couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't somebody breaking in and writing messages on their computer. But the alternative to that was way too bonkers to even consider. The group sat down and really looked at the message that was left. Based on some reading between the lines and some interpretations, they concluded that the message was letting them know that their voices and conversations had disturbed someone's sleep and that the lights which the devil maketh were the computer lights. Ken and Debbie were unsure of what to do next, and it was Peter who almost jokingly suggested that they leave the prankster a message on their computer. Feeling silly, Debbie typed out a message asking who the king was, how old LW was, and how LW was communicating with them and having typed up the words, they left for a walk into the village. When they returned to the house, the atmosphere was tight and silent, like the house was holding its breath. It was dusk, and as Ken entered the kitchen, he knew before he even turned the light on that something was wrong. He flicked the switch, and with a pop and a shatter, The light surged and the bulb blew, and he saw in the brief illumination that the kitchen was not as they had left it. Items were stacked up five feet in the air, plates on their edges stacked on top of pots and pans, cheese graters, odds and ends of fruits and vegetables, chairs leaning perilously on one leg. Debbie had appeared behind Ken, and she gasped at the sight. It wasn't possible. The stacking and the angles just weren't possible. There is no way any human being could have done this. Ken reached out to touch the tower and the entire structure crashed to the floor in an instant and all that was left were the glowing green words softly pulsating from the computer. Thy king, of course, is Henry VIII, who is six and forty, 
I had seen thee maketh leams on thy boist, and thou art sly. Lucas 1537 Henry VIII was 46 in 1537. Was it possible that they were in communication with a person who had lived 400 years before? Was this Lucas responsible for the strange activity in the house or was it all a big hoax? A prank by someone or files that had been pre-uploaded onto the computer? To remove the possibility of the latter, Ken swapped the computer with a new one and still the messages continued. Lucas informed the trio that he lived on a small holding, making a modest living for himself. His wife and child had died, but he was otherwise successful. He said he had attended Jesus College, but had been expelled for refusing to denounce the Pope. Ken wrote back, apologising for disrupting Lucas and being in his home. Lucas continued to write, Ken tried to explain elements of the modern world and left a photograph of a car next to the computer. The photograph disappeared and then reappeared, tattered and crumpled. Lucas left a message asking what kind of wood it was and whether it was made of silk because he had obviously never seen photograph paper before. But Lucas was growing frightened of the communication Mine friend, pray what strange fury art thou? I am confused, so ye be me thinks goodly, but your lies aghast me much thou say thou live, but thou is not so. If you lived, you would say you know not of mine Jesus College. Lucas had left a trap for Ken. Jesus College Oxford didn't exist at that time, and Lucas was afraid that Ken, Debbie and Nick were some sort of ghosts or demons. In desperation, Ken visited a librarian at Oxford University and asked for records from that time to be checked. Ken was fully invested in the story at this stage. He believed that somehow he was communicating with a man from the past. They continued to send messages back and forth, and Ken told Lucas that he was writing to him from the year 1984, which confused Lucas greatly. Lucas told Ken that his real name wasn't Lucas. It was Thomas Howarden. He then told Ken that he thought Ken was from 2109, like the man who had brought him the box of lights. He said that one night he was sitting by the fireplace and the cottage was illuminated by a beam of green light. A man stepped out of the light and told Thomas not to be afraid, and when he disappeared, a box of lights remained, which he spoke into, and the words appeared on the screen. At this point, Ken and Debbie contacted the Society for Psychical Research. We've encountered the Society for Psychical Research before, and in this instance... They found nothing. No evidence of a haunting, but also, importantly, no evidence of a hoax. And no one quite understood what was happening. Was Lucas, or rather Thomas, implying that in 16th century England, he had some form of computer? The idea was outrageous, and even Ken and Debbie recognised how outrageous it really was. But the messages continued. Thomas was clearly both frightened and curious. He claimed to be able to physically see Ken and Debbie and Nicola around the house. And he also claimed to be able to hear their music. He thought they were ghosts or demons. He claimed that the townspeople were becoming frightened. And the sheriff had come to see him talking about witchcraft. The messages took another strange turn and a man called Foulshurst left a message demanding to know whether Ken, Debbie and Nick were demons, what their powers were and how they were contacting Thomas. He went on to say that he was the sheriff of the village and that Thomas had been arrested for witchcraft. 
The poltergeist activity continued throughout this time period, with the housemates arriving home to chalk writing all over their walls, floors and ceilings of the kitchen, some of it in Latin and some of it in an older version of English, the accuracy of which was again confirmed by Peter Trinder. Furniture was regularly stacked up in the kitchen and the activity was deeply impacting the lives of the inhabitants in the house. Debbie, for instance, stopped staying overnight in the house because she was so frightened. The Society for Psychical Research continued their investigations of the house and even took the computer away in order to test it for hacks or bugs. And during this time, Thomas continued to communicate via paper and chalk. Now look, I said before we started this that it wasn't a run-of-the-mill story. It's completely off the wall. And it does get even more off the wall as we continue. I need to be really clear here that I have condensed this story to give it clarity and make it bite-sized. But over the course of 18 months, at least 300 messages were shared on this computer. They were messages from the past. And then there were the messages from the future. The group began to receive messages from 2109, which alluded to a time link which had been established within the cottage, which was allowing Thomas, Debbie, Ken and Nicola and 2109 to communicate. Unfortunately, while the messages from 2109 were many, they were also vague and largely unremarkable in content. They spoke about conducting an experiment and having differing technology in the future. Eventually, Thomas reappeared and wrote a final message to say that he was leaving Doddleston because the people of the village were frightened of him but that he would write a book about his experiences. A last message then came from 2109 in which they explained that Thomas did indeed write his book and died shortly afterwards, but not before hiding the book in a secure location and that the book would eventually be found. There's lots of theories about this story and it has become a cult classic in the world of the paranormal. Ken Webster wrote a book called The Vertical Plane, which had a short print life and as such is very rare, very valuable, and very expensive to buy. And there are some facts that need to be pointed out. The computer categorically was not connected to the internet. That model of computer wiped its memory each time it was powered off, so there is no possibility that the messages were pre-loaded or pre-planted. There were many times where Debbie, Ken, Peter and Nicola closed and locked the kitchen door and then returned to find a new message. Thomas Hawarden was a real man, historically. There is evidence of him. And he was historically expelled from college for failing to denounce the Pope. Foulshurst was also a very real person who was a sheriff in Doddleston around that time. The Society for Psychical Research went on record on a BBC TV show about the topic where they said they could not prove the validity of the claims, but they also could not figure out how it was possible to hoax it. Aside from writing the book, Ken and Debbie tried to continue with their lives quietly and peacefully. In that same BBC television show, a linguistics expert claimed that the language in the messages from Thomas was not in fact written in the 16th century, but rather it was written by somebody in the modern world attempting to sound like they were writing from the past. But on the other hand, ufologist Gary Rowe, who was involved in the case, still maintains that this was entirely real and it will change the world. And he was given access to every single one of the messages that was written. Debbie has defended the story as true on messaging boards and forums online up until the present day. And Ken has never wavered in his assertions that what happened was real. Is it possible that Ken fancied himself a writer and set about creating a narrative that had the weight of being based on a true story? We've always been fascinated by the unwieldy power of new technology. When the telephone was invented we immediately heard stories about people calling their loved ones from beyond the grave. 19th century spiritualists spent their lives trying to use technology to communicate with other worlds and alternate planes. So is it really that unbelievable 
that the dawn of the home computer technology caused people to imagine the endless paranormal possibilities of this brave new IT world. But the real thing that intrigues me about this story is, if it's a hoax, how did they do it? If you want to see pictures from the cottage in Doddleston, if you Google the Doddleston messages, you can see pictures of the writing on the floor, the old English writing, the uh, poltergeist activity, or rather the aftermath of the poltergeist activity. So these were documented by Debbie, I believe, and included in the book, The Vertical Plane. I just love this story. It's really wacky. It's really strange. And I want to know how they did it at the time. If we are to believe that it's a hoax, if we're to believe that it's not true, that it didn't happen, how did they do it? Because it's pretty impressive. And if it was a hoax, then really they would have all had to be in on it. There are lots of people online who say that it was Ken. Ken made it all up. He hoaxed the whole thing. But actually messages regularly appeared when Ken wasn't in the house. And that was proven by other witnesses so it's a difficult one to understand because if it is a hoax they would have all had to be in on it. Peter Trinder is also a really interesting character in this story. He is the one that first suggests that it is in fact authentically old English and he is also the one to suggest to write back which is fascinating and he comes across as a very curious character in the BBC TV show that was made about this. Uh, the TV show is called Out of This World and it is on YouTube and the link's in the description so you can still watch it. It's like a reenactment of the events. And he's just a really interesting character. Did we see somebody having a mental health episode which manifested in this really strange way? I also think as well that if you are going to hoax something it would make more sense to make it less convoluted. Because it is a very confusing story. And like I said at the beginning, I cut huge amounts down out of this for clarity and for brevity. So if it's a hoax, it's a, I would argue it's not a very well, it's not a very clean hoax. So I don't know. But let me know what you think. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to find out more about us, you can do so by logging on to the website, reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. You can also send your own spooky story to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. And on that note, we shall see you next week. <laughs>